Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this um, this special chat that I've been wanting to have and looking forward to have for a few days. Right. So the news is absolutely dominated by one story, and that is Ukraine and Russia crisis. And the news is not only dominated by the story, but one side of the story. We are being told in no uncertain terms that we must take sides here and whose side we must take. And before I came on to do this chat, I had a little look at some of the news coverage today. It is completely one sided. And OK, sometimes the moral issue is perfectly clear. Um, I don't think it is on this. And I wanted to get a different view, or at least to look at this a little bit more objectively, because when the mainstream media tells me one thing over and over and over and over again, I don't trust it. And I don't trust either when our politicians are telling us the same things. These are politicians and media we know lie to us. So I wanted to get a different view. I saw some Facebook posts from Eddie Butler, you'll know Eddie, um, the other day, which I had to delve into a little bit more, uh, very interesting Facebook post. So I've asked Eddie to come on and talk me through this issue so we can have a look at it from a point of view that isn't the one, the sole one being pushed by the mainstream media and the politicians who I don't trust. Eddie, thank you very much um, for taking the time to come on and talk to us about this. Okay. okay, so let me just go, let's get straight on with it. Let me go to your your Facebook, your face, oh, sorry, Facebook, um, Facebook post, where your opening of it was that this was a fake crisis. Why is this a fake crisis? Well, to be fair, that was actually written before the proper war had started. And uh, the Western media, who I don't feel any allegiance towards, mm. although I live, you know, we both live in the what's known as the West. The Western media is really a globalist media. It's not, it doesn't run, they don't operate in our interests of our, of our country. And so I take what they say with a, a pinch of salt. And they were blowing up a big, uh, into being a big crisis when uh, initially, Putin sent uh, tanks into two provinces on the borders of the Ukraine that split away from the Ukraine in 2014. So him sending tanks into those two provinces, which were pro-Russian provinces, in 2014 wasn't an act of war or, or anything. It's a bit like Israeli tanks being in the Golan Heights, which are recognised by the world as being sovereign Syrian territory, but it's been occupied by Israel for years, and no one would, would blink if Israeli tanks went in there, for example. Uh, and so they were making a big mountain out of a molehill over every little move that was being made down there, almost pushing him into the, a corner, actually, because that was before the war, the uh, ground war had really started, uh, by taking all these measures and, and colouring the the crisis as if it was a crisis before it, when it wasn't so he, he almost had nothing to lose by then and making out also that, that Putin's a madman he's a psychopath and uh, all these sorts of usual uh, slurs on his character that come out which are, are rather it's just childish insults really he's a uh, an opponent of the uh, globalist west and so they have to caricature him as some sort of loon uh, dribbling lunatic when clearly he's quite a capable politician. He's been in charge of Russia, which is quite an unstable place to be a leader for. And he's been in there for well over 20 years and, and managed to maintain himself. So he's, he's clearly not an idiot. And although Russia, their economy is, is smaller than our economy, for example, they've also managed to punch quite heavily above their weight, really, in world terms, um, even though they haven't got a very strong economy. Or I haven't got that much money. So he's clearly not an idiot. And he also outmaneuvered out America in, in Syria when, when America was trying to intervene in Syria. And again, no, there's no real outcry about America intervening and bombing the hell out of Syria or Libya or or occupying Iraq or Afghanistan. So there's a lot of, or, and bombing the hell out of Serbia a few years before. There's a lot of double standards I involved in this. Okay, fair enough. So that was before the war, but you, you went on to talk about um, 
the, the makeup of what we in the West and in all this hype now think of us as Ukraine. Tell us about this. Tell us about the, the history of these of Russia and its relationship with Ukraine and the autonomous regions. And what is it that we're not being told about this? It's a little bit more complicated than we're told, isn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, I was. Uh, I, I'm glad you led me into that because we haven't planned this, <laughs> and I wanted to talk initially about the uh, the history of, of Ukraine and Russia. Um, when the, the Ru Russia, some people know, is named after the Rus, who were a, a Viking tribe, a, a group of Vikings that's, that uh, dominated what is now uh, Western Russia and the Ukraine. And uh, from about the mid ninth, mid -ninth century, 860-ish roughly. And um, after they'd gone and, and done some attacks down the rivers into, into what is now Russia, one of the, the famously, the local sort of princes said, I'm going to quote, let us seek a prince who may rule over us and judge us according to our laws. And they actually invited the Rus back in to rule them because they couldn't rule themselves. Russia has always been a bit of an unruly place that, that is ruled by strong leaders. It's not a place that democracies have ever taken root. They actually invited the Viking war leaders in to rule them. And, and that part of Russia included what is now called the Ukraine. Um, and they set up a state called the Kievian Rus because it was based, K Kiev was the capital. It wasn't a separate uh, uh, kingdom or anything. It was part of, it was, it was the capital of this, of this uh, Rus, the first Rus state. And they all spoke the same language. It's known now as Old uh, East Slavic. They also had the same history, the same cultural history, same language, same people. Uh, and this, the Rus state or collection of states was destroyed by the Mongols. It was just after Genghis Khan died in, and um, hordes of Mong Mongols came in and, and wiped out lots of states across um, Eastern Europe, including the Rus uh, states, and it fragmented. That was about 1260, round, round about that time. So it lasted about, that must be 400 years, this thing, before it was uh, destroyed by the um uh, the Mongols, and um, th that led to a, a different history between what is now the Ukraine and Russia, because the Ukraine, what is now Ukraine, was ruled by the Ottoman Turks for a while. It was ruled by Lithuania for a while. The language, very Ukrainian and Russian, are very similar languages anyway, but they they slightly diverse, diverged because of this slightly different history, and Russia fragmented. They've got Ivan the Terrible, got it back together again. And by about 1660-ish, so for 400 years later, they started taking back over Ukraine and it became part of Russia again. And, then, and since then, they've had a pretty much a, a united history. And the only time since then that um, Ukraine's been independent is after the First, what, first World War, the German, the Bolshevik Revolution, and they, the Russians signed a tr peace treaty with Germany called the Treaty of Brest Litvosk in March 1918, before the war uh, ended. And it allowed the Germans to switch all their troops to the, to the West to fight us because the, the Bolsheviks made peace with them. And part of that peace treaty granted a, an independent Ukraine because the Germans wanted to break up Russia. So that was the first time ever there'd been an independent uh, Ukrainian state was a, a German puppet regime in the beginning of 1918 and that that continued for a couple of years until the the bolsheviks took proper control over russia the russian civil war and then it was reincorporated into russia in the second world war when the germans invaded again again they set up a a, a puppet sort of state in the ukraine and because again they wanted to divide and rule and um then again obviously the germans lost the war and it was reincorporated into into Russia, into the Soviet Union, as it then was. The Soviet Union was just another name for the, for the old Russian Empire. And um, but the, the the Soviet regime, part of their philosophy was to recognise national minorities and, and regional groups. So it split Russia up, the Russian Empire, up into lots of little provinces called SS, the Soviet Socialist Republics. The Ukraine was one of them. It's because it was the Ukraine Socialist Socialist Republic. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia were Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and the, the, the those big areas where 
Borat supposed to come from out in the, in the <laughs> Russian steppes, Uzbekistan. They're all independent states now because, um, well, they never had been before, most of them, but they were, uh, the Russian, the Soviet regime wanted to recognize the minorities within them. And sometimes they, they, they put little independent, semi-independent republics within these other republics to make them very unstable so they couldn't um, uh, gain independence probably from, from the Soviet Union. But the when Russia collapsed in about 91, they didn't, when they set these things up, they didn't think the Soviet Union was going to collapse. They thought they were going to rule the world, didn't they? The communist regime thought they were going to conquer the world. So they, they didn't sort of anticipate the whole thing was going to fall apart, which it did. And um, immediately the Soviet central control weakened around 1990 when Gorbachev was, was in charge. Uh, all these separate areas wanted to become independent because it was a, the quickest way to get out of the sort of communist rule. So the Ukraine had a, um, uh, a referendum in 91 and voted to leave the Soviet Union because they wanted to get even the very Russian part because the Ukraine has got very large Russian areas within it where Russian uh, speakers live rather than Ukrainian speakers. And they all voted to leave because they wanted to get out of the Soviet Union. And it meant they, they were getting out of the Ukraine. So you can't really judge that referendum as a as a Ukrainian national re re referendum as such. It was more a, I want to get out of the Soviet Union referendum. And the Ukraine in by then was at its biggest boundaries ever. After the Second World War, great, huge Western areas were added to the Ukraine that they're taken from Poland, uh, Romania, and um, what was then Czechoslovakia. And um the crime in the 50s the crimea which had never been part of the ukraine was added to it because the, the the soviet regime saw the ukraine as a uh their most favored sub-republic after the russian part they they wanted to favor them so they they allowed extra territories to be added to the ukraine including say crimea which had never ever been part of the ukraine before that and was very heavily russian in population um so that's the background, but they all voted to leave um, the Soviet Union in in ninety one. Understandably, because who wanted to be in part of the Soviet Union? No one, no one did really. Um, now, just to come back here, if you recall back then, that Germany, the whole Eastern Bloc was collapsing, and there was a big movement for East Germany. To, to unify with West Germany. And that was a big sticking point. You had the Berlin Wall and you had the, the uh, Iron Curtain Wall, the watchtowers and stuff in between. And um, Gorbachev, who was the um, president of, of Russia then, or I don't know if that was his title, he was in charge anyway, he uh, got an agreement with the West that he would, he would not put any um, problems in the way of East Germany uh, uniting with West Germany, so long as the West would agree not to expand NATO and not take advantage of Russia backing off by by pushing right into them, because Russia was very, from the Second World War and the First World War, because of their experience with Germany attacking them, they're very paranoid about having a defensive buffer zone in front of themselves from potential enemies. So we, we agreed, and it was given a solemn promise to Gorbachev, we wouldn't expand NATO. Uh, and it was repeated to Yeltsin. Do you remember Boris Yeltsin? He was regarded in the West. He's a bit of, a, um, you know, a bit of an eccentric character, but he was also regarded. As, he was a or oh, the poster boy of the West, wasn't he? They, they, he was a merry sort of guy. You saw him dancing on. They had a, the the old Russian generals tried a coup. The Soviet generals tried a coup against the um, uh, the reformers, and Yeltsin led the re the rebellion and stuff you know flowers down the barrels of the tanks and danced on the tanks and all these sorts of things he was a hero of the west for being a, a reformer well in 94 he when he was in charge of russia he went to one of these summit meet east west summit meetings and blew his top at the americans and the, and the west trying to encroach upon this earlier agreement with gorbachev not to expand nato in in further east and they said oh no we won't do it, we won't do it. so they'd given these undertakings not to expand nato or the EU, for that matter, which is, as we know, a political and military union, it's not just an uh, economic union, further east and further east. But Russia 
became weak uh, in that very weak in that period and the west took advantage areas which were part of the soviet union such as lithuania latvia estonia are now in nato they're in the eu virtually all the eastern european countries poland the czech republic Slovakia, bulgaria romania they're all in in the eu now and nato and the boundaries have been pushing up and pushing up and pushing up into into russia um now during this time the ukraine was ruled by uh, although they had this independence referendum the parties that controlled the ukraine which became a, a a democracy but the, the, not a democracy as we properly know it to be fair because it, it's like the russians they're not very they're, there's lots of corruption in in the ukraine always has been but there is in russia as well and it's not a pure sort of democracy but as, as much as it is a democracy the parties that won the elections and ruled the place all the time were very pro-russian and they wanted nice friendly relations with russia and sorry for going on here. But no, don't, please, don't be sorry. The, the, by the 2005, the West was swallowing up Poland, busy swallowing up Poland and Bulgaria and Romania and this and that for Senate. Ukraine was left, left its own devices. By about 2005 ish, perhaps onwards, the West started saying, Oh, why don't you want to join the EU? Uh, to a lot of these countries, join the EU means they get lots of grants from the uh, wow. from Europe and the political class. We, I, I used to work in in the European Parliament for a while, and you go in the in the basement there where the car park is, and you get all these Porsches with Lithuanian number plates on. Their political party's class is bought and paid for by the EU. They've never known such riches and the salaries they get and all the assistance. All the, it's a money train for them. And it's easy to buy the political class out there from someone like the EU. And they started seducing the Ukrainian political class and media, and the Americans as well, in, uh, from about 2005 onwards. And But nevertheless, in 2009, there's another presidential election in the Ukraine. And, and again, the pro-Russian guy won. But this process of seducing them with money and we'll come into the EU and everything will be great and you'll have access to our markets. Really, it's so Germany can access their market. That's really what it's about. And, and there's lots of agricultural land there and it's, it's quite a wealthy area for the EU. They, they're trying to bribe them into it. And that, that process carried on. And in two, that beginning of 2014, uh, there was a bit of a crunch moment when the EU was trying to get them into the EU and the, and this president said, no, I'd rather stick with Russia, which is what he was sort of elected on, really. And there was a, a coup against him and he was kicked out. And so the, the democratically elected president of the Ukraine was kicked out by a pro-EU, pro-American coup in 2014, right on the doorstep of Russia. This, this area, which I said at the beginning, had in, intimate relations and intimate links to, to Russia. Um, and as a result of that, the whole it destabilised the whole situation. That's uh, pretty much as soon as that happened. Obama was the president of the United States then. Biden was his vice president. And that's when Hunter Biden went there and, and was... Um, yeah, loads of money to run an oil company out there when he had no experience. It was all this sort of corruption went on immediately after this Russian guy was pro Russian guy, pro Russian uh, Ukrainian president was toppled. And um, uh, as a result of that, that's when Russia occupied uh, the Crimea and took it back. So, okay, in that case, you can't have the Crimea anymore effectively. As I said at the, uh, a while ago, the Crimea had never really been part of. Um, Ukraine anyway and um, so they, they effectively said oh we're not going because of this coup they took back and then there's these two other border provinces that were very heavy Russian uh, population as well uh, declared independence uh, really with Russian help quite honestly they, they sort of sent unofficial troops in to help them but they broke away uh, and as a result of Russia doing that they were kicked, they were, the, the, you know, the G7, it used to be the G8, Russia used to be part of the G8. Now it's the G7 because Russia was kicked out. They were kicked out of the G8, which is a sort of globalist group. Now, one of the reasons why 
the West had always been picking on Russia and getting at it is because they hadn't been a very um, compliant member of the G, the G78. They're, they're globalist uh, constructs to help push the glo globalist economic agenda. And they hadn't been very cooperative with it anyway, so they wanted to get rid of them anyway, and they used the, the Crimea thing as an excuse to get rid of them, which is a bit of a fake reason, really, because, as I said, the Crimea has always been part of Russia, historically, and if you look at all the other countries that America's invaded and attacked, it, it doesn't really stack up that you'd get a big uh, hissy fit over the Russians taking back the, the Crimea. But nevertheless, they did. And Russia's been excluded from these things like the G, uh, been outside the outside the loop ever since. And because Russia's outside the loop of the um, the globalist agenda, uh, agenda, they've been gunning for them and pushing them and pushing them and trying to get Ukraine into the NATO and Europe and the EU ever since. And that's the um, the background cause for why Russia eventually were pushed into into this shooting war now over the over the ukraine wow right i'm going to try and summarize this so essentially ukraine has not doesn't have a long history of being an independent country it was part of the soviet union and of course with the collapse of the soviet union became in modern history became an independent country uh it's got a pro-russian or a russian population Within. Some of it is doing. The, uh, until certainly up to the election in 2009, when they still elected this guy it, it as their president, who's pro Russian. No doubt, yeah. I've no, I've no doubt that the, the the population has been seduced, as populations in, in all across the world are seduced mm -hmm. by European money. Oh, we'd be better off in that and all sorts of things. You know, no doubt that has happened as well. So they elected a pro Russian pro pro, pro Russian president, even who was. Removed in a coup, backed by the West, presumably? Yes, uh, pretty much an EU-CIA-backed coup in 2014. Yeah. And this made an already nervous Russia, because Russia had agreed with the West not to expand eastwards when the Soviet Union ended. The, the West then went and expanded eastwards, with both NATO and the European Union mm. threatening Russia. Um, with the removal of this democratically elected pro-Russian president to be replaced by a president, is it it's still the pre same president today? No, there's been a couple of changes since then. But, okay. yeah. And they yeah. are pro-West rather than pro-Russia. Yeah. Yeah. So this is making Russia ever more nervous. Yeah. At the time of this coup, they went in and took Russia took Crimea back. And well, that was in, yeah, yeah. declared yeah. independence at the same time. Yeah. It's very, very, very messy. What's the West's game in, in all of this? Is it just globalism driving the West's game in this? I think so, yes. The the um I think they want to remove Putin. See, with I don't know. I, I didn't think Putin would in would invade uh a few weeks a couple of weeks ago because I don't know what the end game for him is. I don't know how he can get out of it. How can he um because yeah, you know, people I just say one thing, just say oh Whatever history the Ukraine may have had, and whatever may have gone in, on in, you know, twelve sixty when the Mongols invaded or something. Now the, the it is an independent country and self determination. They can do what they like. But in the world of real politics, some countries, when you're living next to a, a big, much bigger country, you can't do everything you want to do. It's just that's just how it is. And the West should not have pushed things by trying to bribe Ukraine into the into EU and NATO. They didn't want trouble. If they didn't want trouble, they shouldn't have done it. So I think clearly the West did want trouble um, and did probably, I think they probably wanted, wanted to push um, Russia and Putin into a situation where he did something where they hoped it, it could bust up and, and get rid of Putin possibly. I, that, that, that's possibly what they hope because I don't know, I don't know how uh, Putin gets out of this now. Once he's in, in so he's supposed to be invading with two hundred thousand men. That's nothing. That's a drop in the ocean. He invaded Iraq. We invaded Iraq with a million. Uh, so two hundred thousand into Ukraine is is small beer. And they say that he's only probably put about fifty thousand of them in. Most of them aren't even invaded. So uh, if you can believe anything that anyone says about what's going on, and um, 
So I don't know what his actual strategy is, whether he intends to occupy the whole country, which I doubt 200,000 isn't enough for that. And what's he going to do if he does occupy the whole country? He can hardly suppress the whole country with just 200,000 men. If he puts someone in place, it would be regarded as a puppet ruler and would have a difficult time ruling. So I don't know what his exit strategy is on this. Maybe he's only maybe he's only got very limited ambitions to take over a couple more border provinces. I don't know. But um, it is a very unstable situation. But for, from my point of view, I, I look at this really from what's best for, 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 this, for our country, mm. not um, any other country or, or even the Ukrainians. I, I, if, uh, their self-determination is, to be honest with you, secondary to me, to my, my understanding of what's in this country's best interest. And in my, a lot of people still think, seem to think that Russia is um, communist now. You, you get stupid sort of comments like, it reminds me of um, Lord Raglan, who was the British commander in the Crimean War, but ironically the Crimean War, when we were fighting the Russians. He fought with Wellington at Waterloo, and the, the French were obviously their enemies at Waterloo, but in the Crimea they were our allies. And when he was referring to the Russians, he kept on calling them the French. <laughs> but And it's a bit like these people who now could go on about the Russians as if they're, as if they're communists, as if the Cold War's going on. They're not. The communist, communism is a universalistic um, creed, a bit like Islam, if you like. They want to take they wanted to take over the world and dominate the world. Russia doesn't. Russia just wants now. Russia just wants to be secure in its own borders. I think it's in our interest to have a strong and secure Russia rather than an unstable one. If Putin goes, you'll have a, another basket case country, a bit like probably um, Iraq or Libya is now. And we've, we we could do with a nice, strong, secure Russia. And we certainly don't want to push Russia in the into the arms of China, who, along with um, Islam, the two great existential threats that the West face, faces are, in my opinion, the rise of Islam and the rise of China. And we don't we want Russia as an ally of ours against both of those threats, actually. And they, they are a natural ally of ours against both those threats. So we don't want to weaken Russia. We don't want to upset or antagonize Russia or make them feel vulnerable and, and lashing out because they want to defend their national vital interests, which is what which is what they are doing now. And is that why he upsets the globalists? Because he's a nationalist? Is he a nationalist? Is that probably, I, I, I'm not going to be quite. I'm not. I'm not going to paint uh, Putin as a paragon of virtue, but he's certainly not a globalist in the sense of the others, and he's probably not someone that we would hold up as a great guy or anything like that necessarily. But he he's certainly not a globalist, and he's a thorn in their side, um, which is why they're undoubtedly why they want to get rid of him, and why they dislike him so much. And um, do you know what, what do you know about his relationship with China at the moment? Well, they are building bridges. China abstained when the United Nations Security Council had a vote against um, against them. China abstained. China's been pretty friendly. They're gonna um, they're slightly sitting on the fence, but they're not. They're certainly not um, allying with the Western um, condemnation of him out of hand, and the, the, they will naturally coalesce together. They've, they've had difficulties between Russia and China historically over the years a lot. But we are pushing, well, we are, the, the, the globalists are pushing them yeah. him into uh, China's hands. So what do you think of the UK's response and what should the UK's response to this be? Well, if, if it was... If, I would like to think if, if one of our people had been in charge, it wouldn't have probably happened because he wouldn't have been part of the group uh, threatening him and he wouldn't have felt threatened and wouldn't have um, done it. If Trump had been president still, for example, I don't think it would happen because Trump fully appreciated the uh, need not to push tread on Russia's toes gratuitously. And um, he also had a degree of strength about him, which, which Biden does. So Biden combined weakness with um you know he made some stupid comment about oh uh, biden did about oh if they just do a little invasion it won't matter something but i'm not actually sure whether that wasn't a deliberate thing to, to sort of get to encourage um putin into doing it perhaps i don't know perhaps biden wasn't so stupid but i don't think if trump had been there it would have it would have happened at all because he would have not pushed them into the position where it, it, they'd have felt it necessary 
and similarly if we'd if one of our people had been in charge i don't think we would have done uh but now you know it, obviously you get all these refugee things and all the rest of it just a whole bag of it coming up sending them weapons causing trouble yeah and fr frankly I don't mind Russian oligarchs putting their money into into this country. It, it's something that, <laughs> if you want them to invest anywhere, I, it's we should, so controversial, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> you want to attract foreign investment into your country. Um, I see. You, you, I I do. I think it's a positive thing to attract foreign investment to the country. I don't want to scare them off by in, thinking they're going to get. Even though I don't like Chelsea, you know, I don't mind if he gets his uh, the Bramble gets gets his club taken away from him. Quite frankly, but that's a purely a football matter. But the um, if we you scare these people off, you know, we we should be really wanting to have foreign investment into our into our economy because it helps it strengthens our economy. Not scaring them off by thinking, oh, if you do something we politically disagree with, we'll they'll suddenly impound all your assets. So I think that's a foolish move. And, um, you know, I don't, I obviously wouldn't be sending them weapons and stuff. I wouldn't get involved. I wouldn't get involved at all. But if we'd been in charge, I don't believe it would have happened anyway. So. What do you think is going to happen? And it's difficult to predict, but final question, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, well, it's very difficult. No, I don't. Um, you can't really believe anything that's being said yeah. in the in the papers about what is happening on the ground. I've got. Uh, I I wouldn't presume to know. Um, my the worst case scenario is there's a big cock up from from Putin's position point of view. They go over their tails between their legs. There's some sort of coup in Russia. He's removed, and some sort of Western um, pro Western face man is put in there, and um, Russia is incorporated into the globalist world. That, that, that's probably the worst case scenario. What happens? I haven't got a clue. So I don't know what the Russian exit strategy is. If you go into something like that, hopefully you'd have an exit strategy. You send the tanks in, they've got to come out again, haven't they? So uh, with a better with a better outcome for you after they come out. I don't know what their what their goal is. Any, any other me. any other thoughts? Any other points um, you want to make? It's been it's very educational. Thank you. Well, one of the other interesting aspects is that uh, you drive now. <laughs> After much delay, you've learned how to drive. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> that much. A couple of years now, isn't it? The petrol's gone through the roof, isn't it? Oh, of course. It's, it's one one fifty a point. Not a point. One fifty a ga uh, litre or whatever it is, isn't it? A litre. And um, partly because of the large measure due to this, uh, this crisis. And it showed, like another thing, Trump, he was developing um, fracking and getting uh, yeah. shale oil, which brought pr the price of, he was developing new uh, resort, new um, uh, resources, fuel resources. It brought prices down. But since he's, Biden's putting a stop to it, stopping these pipelines and stuff, and it's putting prices up, and this again shows that we need to be. Uh, even though I don't agree with the, with with, I don't think it would have happened this war if we'd been charged. You need to be in some things some, somewhat self sufficient. We should be doing fracking. We should be having nuclear power. All these other things which make us less vulnerable to these events that happen in other countries which are outside of our control. And that, that's another important feature of, of, of that's come out of this. That we 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 should be developing our own oil industry better, but we should, in my opinion, be fracking and uh, and developing nuclear power. I agree. I agree. But well, it's all part of globalism, isn't it? We can't, yes. No country should be self-sufficient. We should all be dependent yeah. on each other. Yeah, yeah, and all and you know, once someone in one side of the world sneezes, and the whole world yeah. gets a cold or COVID. <laughs> yeah, or COVID. <laughs> Eddie, thank you very, very much for for that. That is um. I think people will learn a lot from that. And and when you are told one narrative, I don't trust it. And since mm. this began, we've only heard one narrative. And and Putin has been demonised. And like you say, I don't think he's... I'm not, not going to start waving a Putin flag. But it's not quite as it's being portrayed. Yeah. So thanks for, for clearing a lot of that up for us. Yeah. Thanks okay. Very all right take care thanks All right. again All See right. you bye, soon. Bye. Bye, bye bye bye
Okay. Um, oh, that's a bit clear. I mean, it, it's good. It's very good for us to hear an alternative view. Um, and you won't hear that in the mainstream press. Why we are where we are. Why Putin is doing what he's doing. And where globalism, crucially where globalism, comes in to all of this. Are they, is the West and the globalist cabal trying to remove Putin? Has the media had a role in pushing Putin into this and made it more and more difficult for him? Not almost to invade it. It, it's, it is not as it's being presented to us. And the globalist issue to me is crucial, as is, as Eddie mentioned at the end there, the price of fuel. And it reminds us, or it should remind us to become, there is a need for us to become self-sufficient in terms of energy. There are ways we can do it. I covered energy in detail on the live stream. Recently, there are ways of us becoming energy self-sufficient, but the globalists don't want that. So a different take. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and I think you need to go on from this and perhaps do a little bit more research into the issues because it's vital for us to be fully informed. Okay, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, thanks again to Eddie Butler for that take on this. And I shall see you Monday live at eight o'clock on YouTube. Thanks again. Take care.